hello friends good evening it's evening in india so uh, uh, i'm saying good evening and welcome to our webinar today we have shridharan who works for thoughtworks and he would be sharing his thoughts towards transition uh, at discuss agile we keep trying to bring diversified experience so we can talk about various subject related to technology and agile and today uh, it's it's about transitioning so let let shridharan take the the call uh, and introduce the things further so shridharan up to you and please start with yeah. your introduction thanks thanks a lot saket first for the opportunity as well as for the setting up the stage hey hey uh, friends uh, this is shridharan as uh, saket uh, introduced i work for thoughtworks uh, i i haven't put a slide up introducing myself because i'm i'm more comfortable talking rather than uh, putting putting lot of slide together you will see it as, as we go along in terms of the presentation deck uh, i play a role of a client partner which you can uh, map it to a account manager in like the other organizations most of the organizations uh, i i do take care of all the existing account client relationship in the market that uh, i am part of as well as uh, i come up uh, with a lot of delivery background so i i do give delivery cover delivery assurance cover or delivery support uh, for mainly the accounts that i am taking care of but sometimes if some other accounts need help uh, that's where i i go help them so that's a brief about me uh, so moving on uh, as saket was mentioning uh, in the beginning i mean if some some of you would have joined early this is not about transitioning into agile uh, this is about uh, if uh, there is an ongoing project that customer wants to transition let's say from one vendor to another vendor or they want to in source uh, it it from the uh, vendor so this is more about uh, what are some of the nuances that we often tend to overlook which might impact the entire transition then the outcome of it uh, i mean if if you take care of it then you will most probably see a positive outcome If, if sometimes if you tend to miss it then what are all the impacts that that we will see that's what i'm trying to uh, go through in the next uh, one hour and if if there are any questions uh, that that you want to ask me or if you on any clarifications uh, i'm i'm okay to take the questions as we go along unless uh, it it's going to take a lot of time uh, that that we can postpone towards the end uh, with that i'm moving on uh, so what really is a transition in agile world and and please remember i am going to focus uh, the next one hour on the agile based transition and not the traditional waterfallish transition or or any other approach uh, the the reason i put this picture over here it it's moving train or there are two moving trains and and we are not going to stop the trains and do a perfect handover of okay let's say in, in this case it's a water bottle uh but we, we we are not going to have a scenario where everything stops and and business is happy to give it the time uh, okay you guys do the handover perfectly and then we will start taking uh, new uh, business features or functionalities that's not going to happen so th this is not really uh handing over but if it's not a handover then what it is so that's something i'm i'm going to go into into the details uh, in the coming slides typically the way i look at transition uh, there are four types of transition uh, and and which broadly covers why are we doing transition in the first place uh, type 1 again th these are all my classifications or my types uh, and there, there is no uh, definition of why it is a type 1 or a type 2 i just put them in in a, a order that's it uh if if it's a multi year uh enterprise big program which goes uh for uh, a longer period of time uh, usually there will be a, a expiration on the current contract and when the customer uh, opens up the bidding process for renewing this contract uh, there are chances that the current vendor might lose out on the whole bidding process so that could be one sort of a transition where there is an incumbent vendor uh, and the vendor has to transition to the new one who has just won the bidding that is one second uh, 
the vendor's performance is below par. I mean, they have promised more, but they are not able to even uh, give uh, like even one fifth of it, or or like even a smallest portion of either the quality or our timeline commitment uh, or the technical capabilities expertise. There are various aspects why vendor's performance could be below par. Uh, then the customer is too frustrated, uh, customer decided to change the vendor, then yeah, you find a new vendor and then you need to do a transition. That could be another type of transition. The third one, uh, which I closely relate to because uh, if you, you would have seen in my uh, uh, proposal note that I myself have been handling an ongoing transition within my organization. And, and that comes uh, from this type three uh, approach, where uh, ThoughtWorks, as most of you might know, uh, we are into software services, but we come with the premium uh, service rates. Uh, uh, there are various reasons why why that is the case, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Usually we go in when there is a new greenfield development project that the customer wants to uh, start. Uh, so you go uh, finish uh, the development and then put it into production and then the project or the program goes into the business as usual mode. Uh, at that point in time there will obviously be a business pressure. Uh, why do you want to keep the premium vendor if I'm going to keep the lights on or I'm going to add smaller functionality. So there is a naturally uh, a, a pressure from the business to go for a, say, let's say a cheaper vendor or, or somebody who can keep the lights on. So that is a third type of transition. And the fourth one, which I'm seeing more common these days, especially uh, in, in India, is uh, most of the uh, offshoring uh, companies are trying to insource their project uh, by by like recruiting similar talents or, or sometimes uh, what fits their organization and and that way they want to uh, get rid of the vendor uh, even if their performance is good in in terms of trying to save or optimize some of the budget that they are spending on the IT so that could be the fourth type of transition there are four aspects that I look at there there may be other types of transitions uh, if if you guys have uh, any other scenario, probably if we have time towards the end, we can quickly discuss, but I'm going to focus on these four scenarios uh, today. Now, uh, in terms of the characteristics of, of these transitions, I'm, I'm trying to uh, put it into a perspective of an incoming vendor or, or an outgoing vendor uh, and the customer himself. Uh, the, the picture you see over there, I mean, you can relate it to any of the roles. I mean, I, I don't mean any offense by putting a dark picture over there, but that's the most uh, anxious picture I, I could find when I was searching uh, over the net. Uh, at different point in time, uh, everybody in the whole transition process would obviously be anxious for various reasons. Uh, in the first case where there is a, a contract expiry and then the incumbent vendor doesn't get the extension, uh, most probably the outgoing vendor uh, is going to be of like least bothered or least interested because I'm not going to make money on this. Why do I invest my best talents? Why do I uh, waste too much time on this? So there will obviously be least interest from the outgoing vendor. From the incoming vendor, uh, they again would have promised a lot of things. Uh, I'll, I'll take over in no time. I'll give you the business functionalities uh, uh, without any interruption. So when, when the actual team that's going to do all of that takes, takes this over, there will be a lot of anxiety, uh, there will be a lot of unknowns, uncertainties, and, and sometimes uh, depends on the equation, incoming uh, vendor could be antagonizing also. I mean, th th there are like very few chances that that scenario might happen, but, but I won't rule that out. And customer obviously will be calculative in terms of how soon I can finish the transition so that I don't need to keep spending money on both the vendors uh, during that process. Second one, uh, fairly straightforward uh, in terms of the incoming vendor. Obviously, there will be a lack of trust on the outgoing vendor because uh, there, there is a definite issue in terms of quality, 
timeline or our capability. So uh, there will always be that uh, mistrust from the incoming vendor as well as the customer. Our going vendor, obviously, yeah, they, they will be the least interested parties in, in this whole transaction. And customer will be worried about the effectiveness, uh, whether everything will be transitioned and then whether I'll see the same quality of deliverables coming from the new uh, vendor that I have just shortlisted. So moving on, the third option is the cost reduction one. Uh, again, uh, as I said in the slide, couple of slides earlier, uh, this is something I could very easily relate to. Uh, the premium price comes with uh, uh, premium competency levels and then good practices, both engineering as well as delivery. Uh, so when, when you go for a not so uh, premium vendor, obviously there will be some compromises the customer would make. Uh, competency of, of the developers or any other uh, roles will, will obviously be slightly lesser. Uh, so that, 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 that's a reality. I mean, there is nothing wrong about it, but that, that, that's a reality. Uh, outgoing vendor, uh, people always want to work on like cutting edge or challenging or, or like path breaking type of uh, assignments. Uh, transition could be the last option they would choose. Uh, and, and they will be anxious to get out quickly, so uh, th there will be that uh, friction always there. And customer, just because they want to do cost reduction, they will be more calculative and then obviously worried about the quality because they were getting premium quality. Uh, what is it, uh, how is it going to be in the new scenario? And the last option, going when they lost the business, so obviously they will be least interested and customer could be antagonizing again because I, I'm going to build a, a IT capability in-house uh, so finish the transition as soon as possible and then get out so that will be the attitude from the customer in, in most of the scenarios. So with that uh, what I call the usual suspect uh, now that we know uh, uh, why we are doing transition and what could be some of the characteristics uh, this could be the typical uh, approach that, that any uh, stakeholder, the senior stakeholder as well as the transition uh, managers will take. I'll go through the scope, either it, it has pages and pages of documentation, uh, I mean even in agile projects uh, I, I won't uh, deny the possibility of people producing documents, right? Uh, so there will be documents or there will be other artifacts which will uh, be taken as an input to study the scope and then come up with, okay, this is going to take so much time and then I'm going to give you a proposal for uh, like a long-term maintenance and all that stuff and you create what you call a comprehensive transition plan. Uh, the reason I put uh, comprehensive under, under double quotes, there is nothing comprehensive about it because end of the day it's a plan. Uh, and then you will put a lot of governance structure around it. Uh, and I, I hope I'm not going too fast. Uh, please uh, uh, stop me or, or uh, give me a signal so that I can reduce the uh, pace of my, my uh, presentation. Okay, uh, and then you will put a governance plan in terms of status reviews, in terms of like the checklist and, and all that stuff. And again, no offense meant, uh, the transition managers uh, from both the vendor organizations and the, from the customer typically get into the admin mode of Okay, there are 10 items. Okay, you are supposed to complete two items by end of this week. Where are you? What goes inside those two items except the actual team that's doing the transition and taking the transition, nobody else bothers about it. And that's where most of these transitions uh, fail or, or doesn't uh, give you the desired results. And there could be additional things uh, uh, that can get into the usual suspects list. Uh, again, you guys would have your own experience, right? Now, am I going to throw a magic wand and, and then tell you, okay, these are all the five silver bullets that, that you can use and, and uh, do the magic? Of course, I'm not going to do that. Uh, most of the coming slides that I'm going to share comes purely from the experience uh, that, that we, we are having in the current ongoing transition or some of the previous transitions that we had done in the past. So there is not going to be an aha moment, uh, but I hope definitely there will be some learnings for 
each one of you from from my own experience okay now uh, what do I mean by not I mean it's not good to begin with too many moving parts for example uh, if, if there is going to be a transition uh, obviously the IT sponsor the, the exec sponsor from the customer IT organization has to set the right expectations with the business look you are going to uh, get a small reduction and then that small could mean uh, relatively different things uh, for different organizations there will be a small impact to your ongoing business functional delivery because we are going through a, uh, I mean obviously you need to slow down a bit you can't stop the train but you cannot go at the same pace so you need to obviously so slow down a bit so that the transition happens uh, without too many risks so you, you cannot promise the same uh, velocity uh, most of you I'm, I you know you would be familiar with the velocity concept because yeah, I mean I assume you have the agile uh, execution background uh, so you can't promise the same business velocity and 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 the second aspect uh, could be you you can't have teams sitting in multiple locations and then trying to do transition over a video call trying to do transition over phones and then emails so you need to have a dedicated co-location I mean you don't need to bring in entire team from both sides to do the transition but you need to identify who are all the key stakeholders that need to be involved and, and then you need to make sure those people are there. I mean if you are trying to do ongoing development and you are trying to do transition at the same time uh, without looking at the, the fine finer aspects of impact or dependency on each other then, then you are going to miss something and, and most probably your transition plan will, will derail and, and that's when all the alarm bells will go up and then there will be a lot of escalations and, and then uh, firefighting, blaming, all that will start. So those are a couple of examples but what I am trying to uh, uh, summarize here is uh, don't try to plan too many things during the transition phase more importantly when you begin the transition. Set the expectations right uh, with all the key stakeholders and, and then start slow, understand the whole gamut and, and then uh, make sure you are not getting the right okay moving on so just by looking at this picture uh, I am sure most of you or all of you would agree you wouldn't want to go through this particular tunnel or the passage because I don't know what am I going to uh, get at towards the end right I mean there is all dark that, that I can see uh, in the transition parlance what I am trying to say by this picture uh, don't start a transition uh, without agreeing on a definite end date I mean th this could be a range I mean I don't mean to say just put a date and, and then that's across and, and and that that cannot be moved and that's written in blood that's not what I mean don't start with the open ended okay I can finish it anywhere between three to six months but I can finish it in 12 months no matter how complex your applications are, how many years you are running your uh, development, uh, you, you, you can't take uh, more than probably, I mean that's a thumb rule I can put, I mean you can challenge me on that, I mean if anything goes more than six months then there is obviously something wrong with the receiving party or the uh, vendor who is giving the transition or, or the whole setup. Uh, so coming back, if you can't put a end date when transition will will get done uh, on day zero when you begin, but at least try to uh, a stage where everything is all leveled and then laid out. I'm okay to go through a slightly rocky and and fumy uh, path but I, I, I see the end of the tunnel there and, and that, that's more important to, to begin with unless you know where are you going to end the, the, there is like lot of people related issues that, that you need to handle from all the stakeholders okay I, I hope that's clear moving on uh, this is in the context of the 
incoming vendor and outgoing vendor uh, trying to uh, work together and, and then learn the internals of the system. Uh, what I would suggest, don't practice on the right hand side of this wall because that's safer. I'll, I'll give you all the less critical uh, bug fixing or uh, not so, uh, I mean if, if I mess up something it's not going to break a critical business functionality. Don't try to uh, play in the safer thirst for too long. Obviously you need to start with that but take the new team along with you. I mean, th th this is more like a father-child. Uh, I mean, if, if a father is going to uh, train his uh, son uh, on swimming, right? Uh, you you can't keep training him on the pool. At at some point, where you know this per uh, your your child is capable of managing the rough waters, just throw him and then you stay on the sides. And if the person your child is struggling, then you are obviously there to go and rescue. Unless you do that, your child is never going to learn how do I manage all those tough situations. So that's that's all I'm trying to summarize. And and th there is no specific timeline. Uh, it it depends on uh, different uh, project context. So make sure you get into the rough waters as early as you can, uh, both from the incoming vendor as well as the outgoing vendor perspective. I hope that's also clear. Now moving on. Uh, I I put this presentation uh, sorry uh, I I put this uh, uh, picture uh, which which I feel sort of gives the confusion uh, whether it's push or pull uh, I don't know if it gives you the same meaning but nevertheless what I'm uh, what I'm trying to say by this uh, particular picture and and then the slide is uh, which one will work better I mean uh, will it be push in terms of okay there are Ten more things that needs to be completed. Uh, you need to get handover on all these things quickly. So I am going to push on this, or the incoming vendor is is going to uh, be more hungry and then trying to pull as much information and and then knowledge so that the incoming vendor feels more comfortable. Uh, again, we can argue uh, for either scenario, but in my uh, context I would suggest uh, go for the push because uh, various reasons right uh, the outgoing vendor uh, would, would be uh, more anxious or would be more keen on exiting this as quickly as possible so that they can start something new with a different customer or, or the same customer different project uh, and, and uh, the incoming vendor sometimes would be uh, getting into the comfort zone of Okay, the more I have the outgoing vendor, I won't be the sole party responsible for uh, any failure if that happens in the system. So uh, I would normally recommend go for push. This is more like an ideal scenario. What, what you are seeing in, in the picture here, this will be like a perfect world scenario where the boy standing behind is the outgoing vendor trying to push the cart and then the boy on the front is the incoming vendor trying to pull. Uh, so th this is probably a perfect scenario where you will go to the desired uh, outcome. Yeah. Moving on, uh, in your organization, if you are already doing pair programming, excellent. Uh, why I am saying excellent? Uh, you you already have a nicer setup in terms of how how do you want to uh, organize this whole transition. Uh, there will obviously be other challenges in terms of uh, getting along culturally, get, getting along in terms of the competency levels uh, or, or the engineering practices and other aspects. But nevertheless, you already have a setup in place where your customer is used to having two developers pair and then uh, give the output. So the easiest uh, option is pair one developer from incoming vendor, pair one developer from outgoing vendor. And there are three scenarios that I'm going to explain. The first one uh, is is more more like when you begin, uh, the cat is obviously going to be the incoming vendor. I'm going to sit there, observe, and then I'll probably uh, give you some uh, meaningless suggestions. But but nevertheless, you are learning in the process, uh, and, and very soon you will also be competent as as the outgoing vendor. That's one. Second scenario, and this could 
probably mean two different things. Uh, depends on uh, how you look at it. Uh, the, the guy uh, sitting more relaxed on the right hand side could, could be the outgoing vendor. I mean, I don't care. I'm not going to manage this mess, let's say, two months down the line. But the guy uh, with the full sleeves on the left, I mean, he, he, he is like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to take care of this for, I don't know, rest of my life. Uh, so what do I do? Th that's one perspective. If you remember the four types of transition that I talked about, uh, this could very well be a scenario where the guy on the right hand side is your customer insourcing uh, person and, and because they are customer and, and they are going to uh, dictate the terms, you are anyway going out. So he is giving you a hard time in terms of, okay, solve this before you go. So the person on the left hand right side could be the outgoing vendor uh, trying to uh, hand it over in, in a cleaner manner to the customer there. So it, it depends on how you see it. And the, this one, uh, I don't know if it conveys the meaning that I see uh, in this picture. This, this to me is more perfect type of pairing. Uh, where I see both of them very attentive, sincere, and, and then the guy uh, on the right hand side to me, I mean, when, when I'm facing the uh, uh, computer, uh, he, he is probably the one who is taking the lead, and then the guy on the white shirt, in the white shirt is trying to uh, get the knowledge transition in. So this, this could be a perfect scenario in terms of how pairing uh, will, will help if, if you are already into that mode. Yeah. Uh, this one is more applicable, the shadowing, reverse shadowing in a uh, typical waterfallish type of uh, uh, project execution as well as transition. So the customer, uh, the incoming uh, vendor will be, it, it, it's in a way the pair programming of today, uh, even though that was not the effective pair programming. But in a way, what they were doing is uh, two people will be sitting together and then the incoming vendor will be more passive during the shadow uh, phase and the outgoing vendor will be more passive during the reverse shadow scenario. And in, in my view, uh, there is no relevance of the shadowing or reverse shadowing in agile uh, world. Why I am saying that? If you are going to go into continuous delivery mode, uh, no matter whether it's uh, uh, the incoming vendor or the outgoing vendor, you have to reduce results, let's say if your iteration is every two weeks or every one week, uh, you, you need to produce results that the business can see. In the beginning I said you need to go a little slow, but you are not stopping. So you need to deliver something to the business throughout the process and the, there is this continuous development that's happening unlike where you can sort of take a pass and, and then do the shadowing, reverse shadowing before you actually resume the business functionality. Uh, so there is no shadowing or reverse shadowing in, in my opinion in the agile world because it's, it's a moving time. Probably it has slowed down a bit but nevertheless it's a moving time. So you, you need to go in the forward direction take this new person along with you and very soon make him the driver and then you become the navigator. So I can probably call it a driver navigator model rather than a shadow reverse shadow uh, model. Okay. This one, uh, again uh, with respect to the personalities. Uh, the picture on the uh, bottom, this is more, more around if I am going to transition the, the application to the new guy, I, I would probably want to play a coach role or a mentor role rather than trying to uh, wrestle with, with the guy in terms of, okay, whether your practices are right or my practices are right, uh, whether you are doing it right or I, I had done it right. So instead of getting into the wrestling mode, try to be the mentor and, and try to uh, go in a positive attitude in terms of playing to the strength of the new uh, vendor. I mean, if, if in a scenario uh, of the type three, where the income, incoming vendor may not be as competent as the outgoing vendor, you don't need to harp on the fact that you are not as sharp in terms of the technical capabilities or, or the other softer skills. So you, you just need to play to the strength of the incoming person and then make sure they feel comfortable and then uh, uh, 
that way it, it's a positive environment where you are doing the transition and, and then it will be a cleaner exit from your point of view also. Yeah. Moving on, uh, people in India, I think you can uh, put context into these pictures, but nevertheless, uh, I, I think IPL is, is more global these days uh, and, and you can relate to these two pictures uh, even if you are not from India. So what I am trying to say by this, don't take it uh, literally when I say play for your club and not for your country. Uh, the way I look at the transition phase is people from different organizations or uh, stakeholders with different interests come together and then there is one common objective that I want to uh, finish this transition successfully, quickly, uh, without any major impact. So it, it's one team versus uh, there is a customer team, there is an incoming stakeholder and there is an outgoing uh, uh, vendor. So I'll try to play you versus me and, and that's not the ideal scenario. Rather, uh, you just pull in people from these different organizations and trying to form the best transition team and, and then hand it over and then you go back to your country uh, team and, and then again in the next bit probably you guys fight to get the next next project from the same customer. But but that's essentially what I'm trying to say. Please don't take it literally when I say don't play for your country. Okay. Uh, remember all of these things that I have spoken about so far, the, the, these are the things that we have tried and we have been trying and then that's giving us the desired results uh, and, and that's exactly what I am sharing in terms of uh, like my experience. Okay. Uh, this one, this is more about having more informal social setup team outings uh, between uh, the transition uh, parties so that you, you, I mean, beyond the vendor client or the incoming outgoing vendor relationship, uh, as a person, you guys connect better and, and then make sure uh, you, you create this setup. I mean, th th this is the responsibility of, of the transition managers or, or the key stakeholders who are interested in the successful outcome of this whole whole transition game. So make sure you know these persons uh, in, in addition to, okay, this person is a developer from my competitor company. So move away from that in, in those social settings and they are going to definitely help you in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, interactions. Uh, this one, this is more about uh, the the work setup. Sometimes this could be the physical location of of these different organizations. And and again, I don't know if this is more contextual uh, for some of you, uh, but I think there is enough uh, merit in in calling uh, this particular issue out. Uh, if as a incoming vendor, your organization has certain practices uh, and, and cert certain cultural setup uh, which is very different from the outgoing vendor setup uh, and if the transition is happening from let's say your location uh, it's going to be very uh, uncomfortable for the outgoing vendor per, uh, team and it's vice versa uh, if, if the situation uh, the scenario is reversed then it's going to be the same so try to find what is the Right. I'm not saying ideal. What is going to be the optimal right environment? Uh, if you have to move into the client uh, location, if, if that's going to be more conducive, do that. But essentially, get together and and do the transition in a place where it is more fun rather than okay, very very boring or very frustrating experience. Okay. Again, okay. remember this is something. We have experienced and then we uh, did a fix and, and then right now it's working fantastically well for us. Uh, I'm sure most of you would know the story of the chicken and pig. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll take probably uh, half a minute. Uh, when chicken and pig wanted to open a, a ham and egg store, uh, obviously we know uh, what chicken has to, I mean if, if they enter into a partnership mode, what chicken has to offer versus what uh, a pig has to offer. Uh, so with that, if you want to be part of 
this whole transition be a pig and, and don't be a chicken where you have no responsibilities whatsoever. I mean, all you do is just uh, give your egg and but you're still alive. Whereas in pig's case, uh, he has to uh, give his life to uh, open the store or, or make, make the ham out of himself, right? So, uh, summary, if, if you are part of the transition, make sure you are committed and then you are accountable and, and then you have a, uh, a stake in that. I mean, don't, don't just hang around and then try to uh, play uh, more of an administrative role because that's going to be frustrating both for you as well as the team uh, in terms of like either getting a desirable answer or, or a desirable outcome. And if you remember the first slide still, uh, I, I sort of uh, put put an open-ended question saying that it, it's not a handover. The way I look at it uh, is it, it, it's sort of a marriage. You are giving your daughter hand in into your uh, groom. I mean, don't take it literally, but, but in other words, this is a project or an application that, that you have developed and, and uh, you have nurtured over years. I mean, this is especially true when you are handling a multi-year uh, larger team programs. And, and you know how attached you are to the application itself. So when you are handing it over to somebody, uh, consider that as a marriage and, and then make sure you hand it over to the right person. Sometimes that's not even your control, but, but nevertheless, assume that the, the, the father has identified the right person, make sure you, you do it uh, with, with all your attention, with all your care, and then, then don't just make it another, another handover. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I have. Uh, I think I, I finished it uh, well ahead of time. Uh, I, I can probably take uh, questions now. Yeah, we have a good amount of questions. So, uh, can you see them in your interface, or do you need me to read them? Yes, I can. I can see. It okay. Now. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to open one by one. No matter what transition, it brings a lot of resistance. Please help us in explain how to overcome the resistance. Okay. Uh, it, it's very true, uh, and I don't know if uh, in in most of my slides I try to answer this question, but I'll I'll still try to take a stab at it. Right. Uh, like I said, there are four types of transitions, right? Depends on which category you fall into, uh, the resistance will come from one of the three stakeholders. I see client, incoming vendor, and ongoing vendor. Uh, talking about my scenario, uh, there is a lot of resistance, uh, or I, can, I, I, I won't say resistance, there is a lot of anxiety from my own team in terms of getting this done as quickly as possible uh, because uh, beyond a point I'm not learning anything new when I'm doing this transition. Uh, so that way uh, I, I won't call it a resistance but, but it, it is something to do with which stakeholders point of view you are looking at it from and, and what is in it for that stakeholders uh, from this whole transition. I don't know if uh, that answers your question and, and if you need further clarifications, uh, I, I can take a leading question if you have one. Okay, next one, uh, will we talk about impact to agile teams when transitioning vendors? Uh, I, I'm not following this question very clearly, uh, so if uh, you want to explain it a bit more. What do you exactly mean by that? Then I'll, I'll try to answer this. Because when you say agile team, is this agile team from which party? Uh, obviously, there will be an impact uh, uh, on all the three parties, right? So there will be an impact. But yeah. what I was trying to explain is, how, yeah. yeah. This is something like which came in the beginning. So if you can look at the time. So I think this was before the presentation. So we can move forward. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in transition, people often do not stress on legacy issues uh, that are not documented. 
and these issues tend to crop up after transition is over. I think yeah, this, this is like a, a very good question. Uh, and in agile world, it it is uh, even more uh, frequent because uh, we we don't stress on creating those comprehensive documents. Uh, on the other hand, uh, to me, the working code or the working software in production today, when I start the transition, that is that is my starting point, or that is the source of truth for for me, right? If there are any legacy issues. Uh, you are either going to uncover it during the transition and that's why it's very important how do I come up with okay what needs to be transitioned and, and then what is the mode of transition also right if you remember the the moving train and there is no reverse shadowing shadowing concept uh, you you always start with what is the ongoing business functionality that I am focusing on and, and if you are uh, if, if you are smart enough you will identify what other areas or components of the application this touches and then you go do your homework after you finish pairing and then if you uncover any legacy issues or if you have a leading question then you are obviously going to talk to the incoming vendor. So there are enough checks and balances that you can put in, in the whole transition, not in the plan. Uh, uh, please uh, be careful. I mean, I'm not using the word plan too much because plan is the plan end of the day. Uh, but it, it's the execution that is more important uh, in in my opinion. So when when you are doing this whole hand holding or hands on sessions, uh, there will be enough opportunities for you to uncover those legacy issues. But even if some of them uh, uh, you you unearth only at a later point, obviously that's going to be like a change request or or that's going to be chargeable back to the customer. So you can't do much about it if, if you can't find it during the transition. Uh, expectation from any transition is to bring benefit. Do the benefits have to be gradual? Uh, I think yeah, you, you already answered uh, this. Uh, so it, it has to be gradual. I mean you can't expect magic uh, by transitioning from one vendor to another. Obviously yeah, you are right. Uh, the end goal is to bring benefit in terms of uh, better cost or better quality or, or better services uh, but not all of these three things will will go hand in hand what I mean by that if you need better quality obviously you need to shell out a little uh, more money uh, and if you need good practices again that costs you more money so it depends on what is your primary intent uh, at, at that point in time uh, then you decide okay what is going to be your new vendor and then what are the benefits that I'm going to get out of this person. Uh, okay, I need to move on quickly, I guess. Uh, these slides are from customer point of view uh, or new vendor point of view. I try to balance it uh, from all the three stakeholders, uh, but me coming from an outgoing vendor point of view, uh, so there there could be some influence of that in the slides, but, but otherwise I, I was trying to make it more generic or more neutral from all the three parties involved. Uh, isn't it will be nice to do this agile way like how you do it? In, ex exactly. Uh, let me finish that question unless there is something I'm missing. Uh, then fine tune it every iteration. Do you think a similar approach? Uh, that That's exactly what you should do. Uh, but remember, uh, customer doesn't have all the money in the world to pay for both the vendors for like a unlimited uh, time period. So like I said, you need to know when are you going to get out of the tunnel and, and the sooner the better, but, but don't try to rush through that, otherwise uh, you are going to miss something along the way. You have to do it the agile way, but you need to have a definite end date. Take it as a, as a clear project uh, where you will have a start date, end date, uh, and, and then you know what are all the different milestones that you need to meet to call it a successful project. Uh, next one, given the situation we have moved from vendor A to vendor B due to business situations and contract with vendor A is ending three months and vendor is aware of losing the business, what would be the best approach to keep the vendor motivated for customer? Uh, I, I can think of a couple of uh, approaches very quickly from, from top of my head. Uh, even though the contract will end in the next three months, 
uh, you can always look at doing a very small shorter contract not for all the uh, people from the outgoing vendor but identify these are all the key members of course they need to be willing to stay for that long uh, because the key members will always be those those super smart guys who the outgoing organization would want to put in other uh, projects as well something uh, situa something a similar situation that i'm going through right now uh, so it, it makes sense to try and approach it that way that that could be one one option i can think of uh, the other other options could be, i mean i don't know so honestly I, I was trying to think if i have another option uh, probably i'll come back to this question if i have one more but this is something you can you can always try and and that should work uh, mostly in cases when vendor is leaving the project the vendor is not even uh, interested to give knowledge transition will always use to hide information not providing end to end information so how should we gather information in such cases if we are an incoming vendor uh, so end of the day right uh, in agile projects th there is nothing called hiding information right because you will come to know about any of those uh, bigger problems or or sometimes even the teething issues as as you spend enough time with the vendor uh, and with the uh, transition and sometimes uh, i did not uh, okay sometimes the social uh, outings are are that kind of a uh, setup will help you because you you will be yourself and and you will be more harnessed outside the pressure coming from your organization you, you don't divulge this specific information don't don't disclose the specific issue that we have uncovered i mean it I'm, i'm not saying with a bad intent that you need to go do some of these social setup outings but sometimes that will bring out some of these issues and and you will also try to take it in a positive way yeah there were reasons why uh, there was a specific issue but then we will bring it to the customer uh, and it's not going to be easy customer is not going to say yes i'm going to pay for fixing that there will be some tough conversations but nevertheless uh, what i can suggest is have more non uh, i mean informal or our social conversations to get some of these issues and there is, there is nothing wrong in doing that and that, that's how i i would say uh what would be the key transition failure modes as per uh, your experience uh, one thing i i would say is uh, if, if the transition time is is too long right uh, you plan for 6 months uh, but uh, end of 3 months it it's very evident that it's not going anywhere i mean still the incoming vendor is is not able to even pick up a small feature the outgoing vendor is handling uh, doing all the heavy lifting uh, that that could be your symptom i mean i'm saying 3 months but you can sense it much earlier again something that happened in in my scenario where uh, the incoming vendor in my case was the insourcing client uh, team itself uh, and and due to huge competency gaps uh, my team was getting frustrated in terms of okay it's not moving anywhere so then we need to think about other strategies in terms of okay identify why they are not able to uh, be effective is it only the competency issue or is is it something to do with the setup that they are in or is it something else so once you understand that then you try to break that away and and obviously from where i was couple of months earlier to today uh there there is like a lot of positive uh impact the, the changes that i brought in uh we, we can see it in the incoming vendor or the client in, in uh, client and source team uh, so there are like different aspects one one is in terms of understanding the ground realities uh, uh whether the incoming vendor is in the driver seat or are the outgoing vendor is still Uh, hand holding or are uh, doing most of the heavy lifting uh, so there could be other other few uh, such scenarios as well 
also i thought we could have feedback learning shared between outgoing and incoming vendors it's it's a very valid very good point uh, and you should do that and uh, this is possible uh, once you have a very uh, friendly environment or a friendly setup uh, the, the moment both the parties start to trust each other uh, and and not look at them as okay i'm taking away something from you and then okay you are snatching my my business and project uh, once the people on the ground uh, come out of that kind of uh, a mindset uh, obviously all these feedbacks and learning sessions will be will be of tremendous value and then uh, it it will give you a lot of benefits what are the major risks during transition uh, it's it's a very <laughs> uh loaded and and a very uh, i mean the answer is going to be pretty long uh, probably i'll park this and then come back to this uh, after going through all the other questions because there is still a lot uh, how can incoming vendor avoid being overshadowed by outgoing vendor uh, again it depends on the dynamics right between uh, the client between the incoming vendor and the outgoing vendor and the scenario the transition is happening uh imagine if it's going to be the type 2 which is more like a poor performance of the incoming vendor uh, obviously you can't do anything about it right uh, because uh, your your team screwed up i mean it, it's as simple as that i mean i don't want to sugar coat it there is something that went terribly wrong so you will be overshadowed uh, the the best thing uh, be sincere do as much you can to transition the project and then get out so that you don't need to go through this mental drama of getting overshadowed or are getting uh, antagonized by both the client as well as the incoming uh, vendor how to handle the communication and cultural backgrounds of the incoming and outgoing vendors challenges uh, yes uh, th th this is again uh, uh, a basic problem that uh, we we were facing uh, so on the cultural aspects you can do only a little bit but at least there will be something common between these two cultures uh, and and then you try to maximize uh, your your social setup or even the formal setup where you bring in the best from these two aspects right uh, if for example english is going to be a problem in terms of uh, communication obviously you cannot learn the other language but but try to uh, go slow or try to use simple uh, terms and then don't don't try to show your vocabulary i mean it, it's as simple as that that's why i call the session as uh, the nuances of transition right because you you might be thinking what am i talking about right i mean sometimes even those minor aspects play a major role in terms of making the other person comfortable so it's it's all about helping each other right end of the day at the ground uh, today you are with company x Uh, tomorrow you will probably go join it's not a poaching is what i mean but tomorrow you might join that company and then you guys will become friends i mean if you are making it too hard for both of you while you are doing transition uh, then you are losing that personal aspect right so make sure you you see the incoming vendor as a set of individuals same applies for the other party also and not see them as like you are you are in a battlefield that you have to win this war so that that's not going to help at all uh, what should do if transition happen from vendor to client itself and incoming team start putting negative inputs on outgoing vendor deliverables just after plan for transition and i think this these are two questions right if i understand so the first one is vendor to client team itself this is more of an insourcing an incoming team starts putting negative inputs on outgoing okay you are talking about the client team putting uh, inputs on the outgoing vendor deliverables just after plan transition uh, this this could very well happen uh, because end of the day client uh, would would probably get into that that sort of an antagonizing mode uh, in in those situations uh, if you are not at fault i would say uh, uh, you you be firm on your uh, approach and and then don't don't yield to pressure it's it's not very easy to practice but uh, i don't see a shortcut to that uh, i mean if if it's going to be like some of those hard conversations you need to have at different levels uh, 
you need to have but as long as you go with facts rather than emotional uh, angle uh, you are always going to get a positive outcome of it uh, rather than okay going the emotional way I have a four year old relationship with you you know me well uh, so uh, you need to balance that right a moment ago I was saying the personal angle but that's not going to help you all the time so you need to keep your facts ready and then on top of it you build a rapport uh, with the other team uh, recently we have left a support project after knowledge transfer new vendor has tried and failed uh, now the project is back in our court meanwhile we have removed the contract resources after the transition okay we do not have existing resources new vendor could not give proper transfer uh, I I haven't come across this situation at least uh, in the recent times, in the past, yes, but but that was a completely different setup in in a waterfallish world. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe uh, we we can uh, pick this up offline. I I can't give you like a very quick fix, quick two minute answer on top of my head. Uh, this this we need to uh, go through uh, in detail and then see uh, if if there is a way. There, there would be definitely. I mean. Uh, uh, at, at least I'm I'm more optimistic uh, when it comes to any of these aspects. I I'll, I'll never get into okay. Uh, I'll I'll rule out and then it can't be done. Uh, probably we can pick it up later uh, if if that's all right with you. If vendors are not supporting and how client KT manager should respond uh, react. Uh, I think this this should not be too hard, right? Uh, it it may be again right. The, look, look at it this way: the incoming vendor will never do that because they just want the project and then they need it. Uh, outgoing vendor most probably can try to create uh, uh, unrest or or not a favorable situation, uh, but it, it's not that easy, right? Because end of the day, it's a professional relationship, and if you are going to uh, be very unprofessional in terms of how are you handling the entire knowledge transfer probably you are going to be blacklisted not only from that particular client but all the other client organizations uh, who this client uh, let's say the CEO or, or, or the next in level CXO guys have contacts with right so it, it's, it's not always that easy that you behave unprofessionally and, and don't support the transition uh, there are like the subtle aspects that you will probably withheld information or you will you will not try to uh, cooperate but like we discussed in the uh, beginning during this uh, slide walkthrough or during the other questions uh, there are there are ways to minimize that impact if not completely eliminate that uh, is it good practice uh, pick up for cube uh, sorry is it good practice pick up few key people from outgoing vendor uh, I I wouldn't recommend this please <laughs> uh, because uh, this is this is not professional right uh, outgoing vendor and hire them for you uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it probably yeah, this is a bad idea uh, regarding hiding the information question uh, who will judge uh, if the transition is complete without any information missed or any specific topic not covered how it will be dealt uh, so to me right there is nothing called 100% transition complete right because that if, if I, somebody says I have completed 100% uh, transition uh, either that person doesn't have a clue about what he was doing he or, he or she was doing or, or they are lying uh, there will always be something that you will uncover as you go along once the other vendor is gone. Uh, all you need to do is uh, pick up those critical key modules and, and that's not very hard to figure out, right? Uh, pick up and, and that's where you need to bring in some of your business people who understand the business well and then who understand the system uh, and then put these two things in perspective and then figure out okay these are all the 10 most critical functionalities that the system should support or this system is climbing to support 
So focus on getting the knowledge transfer on those items first. So once you do that right, then you yourself figuring out the rest, it's not going to be as hard, right? And, and then you don't have unlimited time to get all the nitty gritties transferred. So there will always be unknowns, there will always be some misses, but how well you approach this in the beginning is going to be the uh, most uh, key criteria for, for calling it a success. Uh, how to address and handle lack of leadership support, especially when middle managers pursuing their own agenda. Yes, uh, this, this is a valid, uh, very common scenario. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to remove them. Uh, when I say remove them, remove them from the whole transition uh, engagement, right? Uh, the agenda for anyone, middle management or senior management or the sponsor or the team should be uh, how do I uh, get the content transferred and, and not the ego clash or, or not trying to satisfy my hidden agenda, right? Uh, and, and that's where the exec sponsor or the senior managements need to be uh, involved. I mean, when I say involved, you don't need to spend too much time uh, with the transition uh, team, but you you should know when when do I invest my time to understand the ground level realities uh, and, and understand the dynamics, understand the nuances again, and, and make sure you make the right calls. I mean, if it is specific to a specific middle level manager, uh, he or she is, is trying to run with this or her agenda, then never hesitate and replace that person immediately and that will send the right signals to rest of the team. And if you are not going to perform, if you are trying to over, act over smart, then, then you, are, you are going to be shown the doors, right? That, that should be the way from the senior management. How to bridge up the gap between outgoing and incoming vendors when we both are in different geographical, sorry, geographical locations. Uh, my sincere recommendation, uh, co-locate as much possible in either of the uh, locations. If you remember the last but one slide, uh, try to see which is the most favorable location uh, because that's where you are going to get the best results out of it. Uh, please don't try to do it over phone, over emails, over calls or anything because that's never going to be effective. Uh, cost is obviously a factor, but you, you need to come up with your facts why uh, you need to uh, spend that additional money to do the co-location and then get it done quickly. Uh, I hope I answered uh, the questions. And there is one that I need to come back, but I think we are running out of time. Yeah, Sridhar, and we do have many questions. I'm not assigning you anymore. And <laughs> I'm requesting all the audience to uh, tweet your questions. Uh, Sridhar is very much available on Twitter. And if you follow yes. Discuss Agile Twitter handler, I have tweeted a good amount of tweets today of why I discuss Agile. And uh, most of these tweets has attacked uh, so Sridhar. So you can, you can tag him so he will respond back. That could be a one channel to get the, the responses. So thank you everyone and thank you Sridhar for taking time out and talking about transition with us today on Saturday evening. And thank you all <laughs> the participants for participating. And queries related to PDUs, SEUs, please hold them for next 24 hours. You will get an automatic email from us which will have the details. And if something still gets left, please use forum.eisenbridge.com for PDUs and SEUs related details. You get uh, category A SEU for your CSP and you can claim category A, uh, category A PDUs for your PMI related certification. So those details will follow up. Just give us 24 hours time because it's an automatic process. Thank you. Thank you everybody and thank you Sridhar again. And uh, Thanks so back. much uh, Raket and the people uh, for patiently yeah. listening in to me. I hope it was useful. Yes, yes, yeah. it was very useful. Sure. Thanks. Good night everyone. Good night.